in our last uh, uh, lecture, we discussed Habermas, and I think that we left out at least one thing I need to, to begin with before I proceed with uh, Foucault. And that's uh, Habermas's view of the self as a thoroughly social being that is the interaction of the natural world, the social world, and the inner world of, of human, as it were, suffering, sympathy, a uh, subject entwined in desire. Those are the three dimensions to subjectivity that Habermas discusses, and he sees each one as challenged in the late 20th century. And so I wanted to add that to maintain our subject under siege theme. Habermas's account that, I, that I've just finished is, uh, as, as it were, one of the more optimistic accounts, if you will use a, a word that simple, it's one of the more optimistic accounts, but it still does not relieve uh, the subject of the incredible pressure to construct meaning and conditions for communication under conditions that are very unfavorable for that to occur. I mean, that's still a part of his account. Uh, we will now uh, move on to uh, a thinker who, in at least a couple of respects, is like Habermas, and that is a, a, a magnificent, uh, uh, I, it's hard to characterize him as a philosopher, and no one knows exactly where to put his books. We, we don't know whether he's a historian, a philosopher, a sociologist. In fact, that's almost the mark of late 20th century thinkers. It certainly is the case with Habermas that we don't know where to, to stack his books, and so similarly with Foucault. They move across disciplines, and I think that's very important. So that, that, that is one thing they, they, ha they share in common. It's difficult to know uh, the disciplines they're in. The, another thing they share in common is an interest in emancipation. In other words, we're, we're again talking about, in this case, not as, not as in the case of Habermas, a left liberal style thinker, to use an American phrase here. We're talking about a very radical thinker whose politics, like the politics of Noam Chomsky, who the last time I checked was an American, uh, <laughs> Noam Ch like, like Noam Chomsky's politics. This is a person who is what I would call a principled anarchist. Now this, is, he has a difference though. He does not, in a way, have his politics intervene in his writing nearly as much. In his writings, what he tries to do is to develop a fundamental critique of what I might call our dominant ideologies, which are sort of centrist. A little liberal this and a little conservative that, but he tries to develop a powerful critique of what you might call the dominant paradigm within which we do our politics, within which we run our ins educational institutions, within which we operate our prison systems, within which we operate various psychiatric disciplines, and so on. Uh, and he does this in a different way. Unlike Habermas, whose account is very abstract, if you, if you noticed, uh, Foucault enters his topics through the avenue of, of what might be called histories, but they cannot be understood as history in the traditional use of that word. And so I'll start by uh, giving a brief account of some of the jarring things about Foucault. One is that Foucault is infamously known for holding the view that there are no facts apart from interpretations. So for Foucault, there are no bare facts in history. In other words, there aren't just little facts you run across separate from the interpretations within which the facts are embedded. So this makes history look like a kind of battleground. In other words, you've got your story and I've got mine. As a matter of actual historical practice, when you read historians, I don't think this is a bad description of the way they actually work. I don't know why uh, certain neoconservatives like William Bennett find this to be relativism. When I see it, it's just a good description of the way historians actually practice their craft. And it's not a simple-minded thing like everyone has an ax to grind. It's not like you don't get surprised even based on your own interpretation. And it's also not the case that as you work through your interpretation, you do not change it radically and change your mind and your prejudices. In fact, when you do that, 
that's when you are doing your best work usually. So uh, I don't see this as, as outrageous as many other people do. Now the word history itself is avoided by Foucault because he thinks that the word history within, the West, within Western civilization is necessarily a kind of continuous narrative about progress. So Foucault prefers to the term history terms like archaeologies and genealogies. You may notice that this is a, uh, some of the influence of Nietzsche on Foucault. Nietzsche wrote a wonderful history of moral life as it had arisen in the West, but he didn't call it a history, he called it a genealogy. So what is the difference between genealogies and histories? And at least these uh, following conditions are ones I've been able to pick out in Foucault's work. One of the methods that's different in a genealogy and a history is what might be called the reversal of perspective. Now this is one he takes from some of the better historical work in the uh, tradition of Marxism. And that's where, and, and I mean Marx is famous for this, but so are some people that you should know about like E.P. Thompson who wrote The Making of the English Working Class and C.L.R. James a wonderful African, or not, uh, Caribbean intellectual who wrote uh, The Black Jacobins. This is reversal of perspective. It's where you don't write history from the standpoint of Henry Kissinger, but from the standpoint of the masses of humans that do the masses of things that they do in order to produce large and significant movements that change formations, social formations. And this is really to take sort of a reversal of perspective. You take what, in a way, is left out of the official histories and use that as your clue to write a history of suspicion that something's been left out. Uh, a history like that of the American Revolution would be fascinating, and I know at least one person, Larry Goodwin at, at Duke, who's working on uh, such a project. Well, anyway, reversal seems to be a method of genealogy. Another is one connected to it, and that's marginality. You don't just pay attention to what the leaders said, or the men said, or whoever the dominant group is. You look for the marginal discourses that do two things. They both make clear that there was a marginal discourse, and they also show more clearly what the assumptions of the dominant history or discourse was. So marginality is another feature of what might be called a genealogy or archaeological method. And the, other, the third one seems to me just uh, a very practical principle. It's a principle of discontinuity. And that means write your history without the assumption that history is continuous, uh, without the assumption that it will end up being a rational story, without the assumption that it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, but rather accept history in what is called its materiality. You know, in other words, along with all of its contingencies, its moments of luck, the strange and bizarre things that happen. I mean, even Marx does this when he writes the history of the rise of capitalism. It just turns out to be fortuitous that gold is found in the new world, which then can be sent back to Europe to build merchant capital. Well, if over here they had found cow chips only or buffalo chips, then that contingency would have affected history. And that seems to me to just be not something that could have been predicted by a rational narrative. They happen to find gold. You know. So don't assume that there will be, as it were, a telos. And this is deeply embedded. Telos means gold, I mean, it's, or purpose.